Hi guys. I wanted to thank you for joining us, joining us this evening on our second part of our trapping webinar that we have going on. Um, I do want to give you guys a heads up with the lovely weather that we are having in Iowa. We, you might have a, you might have a hard time viewing the informative videos that we have presented. Um, if so, don't be worried about it. We will be, we are recording this workshop and we will be sending this workshop out with um, more resource material at a later date next week. And so if you do cut in, just feel, just try to come back in and don't be worried about missing anything because you will be receiving these videos in this recording later on. Um, so it's our second day of our trapping workshop. With everything social distancing related, we are unable to do any in-person events and we're thankful to be able to be here with you via Zoom tonight. Tonight we'll be recovering how, we will be covering how to properly set up your equipment in the field when trapping, the type of equipment needed for trapping, pocket sets, and so much more. Tonight we will be utilizing the chat, um, chat box as well as the question and answer box and your guys' Zoom at the bottom hand corner. You guys can find that down there. If you have any questions at all, feel free to go ahead and utilize that question and answer toolbox and we will be more than happy to get your questions answered for you. We have an awesome panel set up here tonight and they will be um, able to answer anything that you have and you have their full attention tonight. So make sure to ask all the questions that you guys have so we can go ahead and get those answered for you before you get out in the field trapping. Um, so tonight, if our panelists will, our panelists will reveal themselves and add their video. We have Steve. Steve Grabo is the Woodbury County County Conservation Officer, and he was with us again last week, as well as Vince. Vince Evelsizer is with us tonight too, and he was with us last week too, and he is the fur bear biologist for the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. And Dakota will be hopping on and off with us, and he was with us last year, last Tuesday too working with us, although he is having a little bit internet connection because of the weather. So he will be hopping on um, momentarily, but I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Vince and he's gonna to talk to you guys about the equipment. Good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you and to spend some time on this whole topic tonight. It's kind of the more exciting part where we get into the equipment and techniques of trapping. Um, also keep in mind, we're going to do what we can here with tonight's seminar, but if you're a beginner, you know, don't be overwhelmed, you know, with it or feel like it's too much. Just take baby steps with it if you do want to get into trapping and you're new. So this is really only the beginning, you know, of many more things you can learn and teach yourself or learn from others. So with it being a virtual uh, you know, webinar platform where we can't be in person, you know, with you guys, like we like to be in the field. Uh, we, we did elect to show you videos because we thought that was the best or most efficient way to, to simply show you, you know, how to do some of this stuff. So when getting started with that, um, we wanted to go through some of the basic trapping equipment um, one of the other panelists here, Steve Griebel, is walking through the trapping equipment and then he'll even be in some of the techniques videos after the trapping equipment video. So I believe we have, again, four videos, line, segments from four videos to go through with you. The first one being trapping equipment. The second one is uh, coon sets, mainly pocket sets and a few other types. And then the third video will be predator trapping on dry land. And then the fourth video again will be fur handling. Um, we can't go through every type of set to make for every type of critter. So the point of these videos tonight is sh to show you some of the more basic or common ones that you're likely to try out if you're a beginner at some point. So we can get going with the video here whenever we're ready.
when we're trapping, uh, it, it always seems like we're, we're digging holes or moving dirt. So you're gonna have a variety of shovels and that sort of thing. So if you're digging a small hole, maybe in a, in a dirt hole set, small shovel like this, uh, this one happens to be kind of rounded so you can stick it in the ground, twist it, pull out little plugs of dirt. You can hand manage this pretty good. It's got a nice T-handle on it. This is a very solid shovel. Um, another version of that same shovel for working in the, uh, working in the a little bit deeper water, say, or uh, digging deeper holes in the bank would be something like this. Um, we talked about safety a little bit. Another good thing when you're walking the water is to have some, some sort of wading staff and a shovel that's a little bit longer like this would work out good. Same deal with this shovel here. It's got a nice D handle on it. It gives you a good grip. When everything's wet, it's hard to hold on to. So any kind of shovel with a T or a D handle on it gives you good, good grip and you can, you, can, you can work the bank a little bit and uh, won't have as much fatigue on yourself. Uh, some of the dirt traps, uh, the, the dirt trappers will use uh, more of a, a hole in the ground and you can, uh, like I said, either dig a hole like this. If you don't want to work quite as hard, you can get something like this that you put in a drill, just auger a hole into the ground. If you don't want to deal with electronic batteries and still want to use the auger type system, there's hand augers, just kind of like the, the older tools. So uh, you literally just screw it in the ground and you keep pulling the dirt out and that'll give you nice, a, a nice uh, uniform hole. When you're, uh, when you're setting your traps, you're going to need some sort of anchoring system, whether it be a re-rod stake, varying lengths depending on the soil conditions. Sometimes you're going to pound them straight in with a shorter stake. Sometimes you're going to cross the stake if it's a, a little bit sandier or wetter ground. There's a cable anchor, kind of like this. There's different versions. This happens to just be one brand that we had, had handy. You're going to pound that into the ground. When you give it a pull, that anchor turns sideways. Gives you a lot more, uh, lot more holding power. The advantage of this over this is it's lightweight. They are a little hard to pull out of the ground, so you're going to need something to, to help pry them out of the ground. If you're going to be pounding stakes into the ground, you're going to need some sort of hammer. This is just a simple sledgehammer. That's what you're going to use to run a, a driver like this into the ground. How that works on this type of earth anchor. Pound it into the ground, pull that back out, give that a little, little tug and it'll set it back in there. So obviously you're going to need a hammer to drive stakes in the ground. Uh, the difference on this hammer here, there's a little digger on the back, kind of a claw, so you can pound your stake in, chop out a trap bed, scrape dirt, whatever you need to do. If you need to chop some sticks, you have a little, uh, a little bit of a sharp edge on there, similar to a hatchet or an ax. So pretty handy tool. They make some of these that have a, 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 a bent out pipe on them that you can actually grab and, and dig holes with too, kind of a three in one type tool. That's a, that's a pretty handy item. This happens to be an S-hook tool. It's used to close and open S-hooks. Very helpful on the trap line. That's how we're connecting chains or connecting traps to anchors and that sort of thing. So that's a very helpful tool to have. Wire cutters or cable cutters are also almost a necessity. Anytime if you can't pull an anchor out or if you have to cut wire, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be using snares, you're definitely gonna wanna have the cable, to, uh, the cable cutters to uh, help get the animals out of the sets and, uh, and clean up after yourself a little bit. Um, there's a lot of different versions. If you're gonna use a lot of cable, a lot of wire, uh, a good cutter is worth its weight in gold. Generally, you're not gonna wear them out, you're gonna lose them first. So you notice a lot of my stuff is painted orange or, or a bright color, that's by design, so that you don't lose it out in, 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 in the, the dry grasses. Um, wire is also always a necessity on the trap line, whether it's wiring things together that are broken or, uh, or trying to, uh, to anchor traps. This is just the little deal I did with, with tape. Wrapped around, you can pull the, the wire out of the middle of the coil. Keeps it from getting wrapped up and everything else. If you're going to be uh, setting in, in, in dry dirt, uh, the canine sets, the predator type sets, you're going to want some sort of dirt sifter so you can scrape dirt, sift out the big chunks, the grass, throw that away and have a nice clean dirt pattern to pack around your traps. And we'll learn more about that in some of our other videos. Um, this is a, uh, it, called an underall. It's just one specific brand. There's a lot of different brands. Some people use cotton, some people use uh, uh, different sorts of polyfill like what you would use in, a, uh, in sewing applications. That goes underneath the pan of a trap. And then there's also pan covers, whether it's screen or uh, a mesh or wax paper, something to go over top of the pan of trap to keep the dirt from under the trap. As you're packing dirt around the traps, you don't want to go into the pan or the trap simply won't go off. It's always nice to have some sort of a bag. You don't have to have anything fancy. You could have something from, a, from your local store or there are commercial products available as well to hold your different trapping lures and baits, all the different attractants that you use to get specific animals to specific locations. Um, this is a tool bag, lots of, lots of different pouches. You can put everything in there. 
and uh, it, it helps you be a little bit more efficient on the trap line. If you have your hammer, your cutters, S-hook tools, wire, sifter, shovels, all that stuff is in here. You can grab it and go when you need to make a set. This, set, this driver here is a little bit longer. If you're trapping in the water, you may want to use long re-rod stakes. Again, if you're carrying stuff or in a boat, it takes up a lot of weight. You can make these anchors any length you want. This happens to be 16, 18 inches. You can make them three or four feet long. The advantage of that, you can use a longer driver and drive them farther in the ground to, to get into solid ground. If you have a lot of silt on a river or, or a pond, uh, anywhere where there's a, a, a lot of silt or very soft dirt, you can run something a little bit deeper and, and make sure that they're anchored uh, very securely. Uh, anytime you set a trap, you want to make sure that uh, whatever you catch is, uh, is not gonna get away with your traps. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the traps that you can use when you're out in your trap line. Um, the most inexpensive traps are snares or cable restraints. Uh, there's different kinds of cables. There's um, from, from 16th inch cable up to eighth inch cable and a lot of different types, whether it's uh, multi-strand or multi-strands of multi-strands, say a one by 19 or a seven by 19 cable. There's different kinds of locks on the cables, the cable restraints or snares as they're commonly referred to. Some are, some are a little bit more complex. Some are very simple. This is a cam lock. Some are just a bent washer, but the purpose of the, of the lock is to do just that. It'll close down and it doesn't open back up. So it'll hold the animal or restrain the animal until you're able to return. Um, in Iowa, we have deer stops. It's something we need to make sure we have in our snares. It only allows them to close to a certain, uh, certain diameter. You go down your snare, there's, there's a, a thing called a whammy that will help hold the snare on wire and um, you, to, to, help, to, to, to help support the snare when it's set. And then you're gonna have to anchor that snare, whether it's to a re-rod stake, to a cable anchor, to a tree, whatever it may be. And snares with swivels. Swivels are always great with trapping equipment because they add strength and allow things to move without getting twisted up. So uh, very simple snares, it's, it's small, uh, inexpensive. They're you know less than $20 a dozen, sometimes as cheap as 10 or $12. That'd be good for a coon-sized animal. If you go to a coyote-sized animal, it's taller. You're gonna need a longer snare to get it higher off the ground. So uh, that's just one option on a snare, different locks and, uh, and uh, different lengths of snares is, uh, is, is the, the variable there, and that's a personal preference. But a lot of different options that you can go with. Uh, there's, uh, they're very effective, they're inexpensive, but they're a one-time use. Most of the time you can't reuse the cable after it's caught something, but you, what you can do is cut the parts off and rebuild your own snares to save a little bit more money and be a little bit more efficient. Uh, the next type of trap that we're gonna use is a, is a body gripping trap. Uh, there's, there's different brands. This happens to be a 110 size trap. That's gonna be for the mink and muskrat sized animals. Uh, these are kill type traps. You wanna be very careful where you, where you place them, making sure that uh, they're, they're not where you uh, may have non-target catches that are, uh, you know, that you're putting in danger. So uh, that's, a, that's a smaller animal size trap. Like I said, the, the muskrats and mink. Um, you jump up to the next size. This is, a, this is a 165 or 170 size trap. Uh, that's also uh, usable for mink and muskrat in some, some aspects but uh, generally used for coon trapping, possums and skunks, that sort of size animal. The next one's a 220, 280. They just keep getting bigger as the number gets bigger, right? And then a, um, this is a 330. It's a very common, common trap. Uh, we talked a little bit about safety. All your conibears bears with two springs are gonna have a, a safety latch on each spring that keeps the springs, allows you to set both springs. On this trap, this is another thing that I, I failed to point out earlier, but it's a, a safety spring. So if this trap was inadvertently snapped, it's not gonna go off this is gonna keep you safe. So um, you just don't want the traps around your fingers when you're trying to set them. So uh, this size trap is a little bigger. This one needs to be set completely underwater. You can see the size. Um, generally designed for beavers and otters and, and uh, it will catch other, other animals that are underwater, but uh, most effective for, uh, for beavers and uh, otters. So there's, there's multitude of, of foothold type traps. You have the long spring traps, hence the name. They have long springs. You have coil spring traps. They have coils on them. You have underspring traps. The spring is underneath the trap. There's a bend, and when you pull this down, that's what that's what gives the trap its its uh, its firing power. Uh, the long spring traps are very easy to bed because they have a lot of surface area. Coil spring traps are generally a little bit faster, more compact. Most of the land trappers will use these, whereas water trappers generally use the long spring traps more frequently. But uh, coil springs are very common. More of an older style trap, more modern as in modern in, in the last dec, you know, not in the last decade, but the last century. Um, you can replace these parts more easily. And uh, the underspring is not something that's uh, popular as much anymore. There's not as convenient to set. They have plenty of holding power. They're, they're, they're extremely effective, 
but the coil springs are uh, a little less expensive to make than these, and the, uh, the long springs are just a little bit more common. So the next thing you can look at on your, on your foothold traps is the jaw type. This is just a standard closed jaw trap. It's closed here, standard uh, uh, thickness on the metal, whereas this trap is a little bit thicker, a little bit thicker jaw, more surface area on the pad, uh, helps prevent any kind, of, any kind of paw damage. And then there's also laminated jaws where you take the standard jaw, lay a piece of metal under it and underneath of it, it gives you more surface area. It gives you more holding power on that type trap. You notice on this one, it has more of a square jaw. This is more rounded. Different companies, different brands and personal preference all kind of come into play there. Uh, another thing you can look at on the jaws is um, whether they're offset jaws, where there's a gap between them, the standard jaw, where they close tight together, or a rubber jaw, which uh, was designed to, um, to, to, to lessen the blow and, and, and try to not to cause damage. Uh, we use best management practices and uh, in association with, with some of the vets and, and input from, uh, from those professionals on how to humanely trap these animals. And in some cases, if these traps aren't, uh, aren't, aren't, aren't taken care of and well-maintained, they're, they're actually not as helpful as, as the standard trap. So it's just another option with the rubber jaw there. We also have dog-proof type traps, and there's, there's a lot of different brands. You happen to have two different versions here. How they work, again, you're gonna have to anchor your trap. Anytime you can use multiple swivels, the better, it gives you more holding power. These traps, the animal has to reach down in, grab the trigger, and that's when they spring the trap. So uh, they're generally designed for raccoon trapping. You can catch skunks and possums, we've seen that. But they're generally designed to trap raccoons, and they, they call them dog-proof because there's no way for a dog to get in there and, and, uh, and get caught. We're going to talk a little bit about how to anchor your traps. Obviously, you've invested money in the traps. You want to, you want to keep them, and you don't want your animals to get away. You want them to be there when you return to your set. So the, uh, the most common method is the re-rod stake. Um, it's effective. Uh, they, can, they can pull out sometimes if they're, if they're too short or in, in, in uh, sandy or muddy ground, and they're a little bit heavy. So um, we've uh, developed some things over the years. Uh, this is the earth anchor. There's a million different kinds. Um, long story short, it's what we call it a curb cable anchor. You're going to push it in the ground. They have a little bit more holding power. They're very, very lightweight. They're pretty inexpensive. Uh, sometimes with the body gripping style traps, you want something that will hold the trap stable so that the animal can walk through it. Uh, this just happens to be one different brand. You adjust the height by however far you push it into the ground. So it's gonna sit there just like that above the ground. Um, you can kind of turn it this way and that way. You can change the angle on a hillside, that sort of thing. They make different types for different, different size traps. Put them in the water, in front, of, in front of holes, wherever the animals may be. They're also, uh, they have different kinds of boxes or, or, or um, uh, cubby type traps. Um, this one's for mink. You put some sort of bait in the back. This holds the trap stable here. Run a re-ride stake through the hole in the back. That way nothing, uh, nothing will take off with your trap. And uh, the animal will go in there to get the trap and or get the bait and uh, get caught in the trap. So that's another good method. Something that they use mostly in western states, we don't really recommend it here in Iowa, particularly for young trappers, is a drag. And it's just that if you're in really rocky ground or ground that can't, uh, won't be able to effectively hold a stake, you attach the trap on a chain to this drag. The drag will, when the animal gets caught, it'll move off, catch something, and it, it won't be right at the set location. It'll be somewhere nearby. Different sized drags for different sized animals, and uh, you know different length chains for different conditions. But uh, uh, effective. They're Ill illegal to use in Iowa on snares or cable restraints. But uh, they're, they're effective on footholds, but definitely not something we recommend for new trappers. Uh, it'd be something more for a veteran trapper who's skilled in tracking and, and keeping track of where their animals go to. So uh, again, make sure anytime you set a trap, even if you're trapping muskrats, that you, set, uh, that you anchor your trap for the biggest animal you may catch. So even though you're setting muskrat traps, you may catch a beaver, make sure that your set will hold a beaver. Well, anytime that you invest money in equipment, you want to take care of it, whether it's a car or tools, it's no different with trapping. So if you're going to buy a new trap, it's going to have some oil on it. You want to wash it, get all that oil off of there, make the adjustments to the trap to make it uh, function properly. After that, you're going to want to treat the trap with something. A uh, tried and true method is to boil that trap, and, uh, and this happens to be logwood dye. That'll change the color of the trap, helps uh, inactivate any rust that's on it, and gives you good, good color. Um, and then you can wax that trap. You boil the water, keep the wax on top, dip the trap through it. Kind of a, a tedious process. It's very effective. It'll maintain your traps for a long time, especially if you're using any kind of antifreeze or salt. You want to make sure that they're protected. If you don't want to do that, there's, there's different kinds of, of, of dips 
and there's a variety of difference. This one happens to be a, a black dye, there's brown. It really makes no difference on the color of the trap. It's just personal preference. You're gonna mix them with gas or a coal, like a lantern fuel or white gas. Uh, you do not want to use ethanol with them. It'll just turn into kind of a sludge and, and mess your trap. So when you get done, take a new trap. If you're gonna dip it or dye it, it's gonna look something like this. That's gonna protect it from the elements. Remember, your traps are sitting outside in the, in the mud or in the, in, 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 in the elements for, for weeks on end. They're in the moisture in the ground. They may have uh, antifreeze like a salt or something like that to keep the trap functioning in cold weather. And if you don't take care of it, it's going to rust. And it looks something like this, where your investment is going to be worthless. You're going to have to make repairs, and it's not going to function effectively and, and help you main the trap. I hope uh, that video was helpful for you guys watching tonight. Um, remember, if you have any questions to feel free to ask Steve or myself um, what Sophia was referring to earlier for doing that, for asking questions, is to simply uh, move your cursor to the bottom part of the window on your screen of your computer and you'll see a, a row of buttons along the bottom and one of the buttons is Q&A. Um, simply click on that and it'll open up a little chat box where you can type in your question for us and then one of us will answer it. Um, also, yeah, I think that's the best way we can with this method here tonight anyway. So feel free to do that. Um, if you guys, so I forgot to introduce myself a little more. I'll do that really quick. Um, just so you know who we are again, my name is Vince Appleseiser. I'm the fur bearer biologist. So I, I don't do as much with law enforcement at all. Um, that's where folks like Steve and Dakota Drish uh, introduced earlier, they do law enforcement. Um, they're officers um, in different parts of our state. So the part I do is more with the wildlife biology where we're looking at the populations, the annual harvest, um, disease things, um, things like that more. So that's kind of a little bit with who we are. So with that, um, should we start the next video, Sophia, um, which is um, the I think tracking. Steve actually had something that he wanted to say. Great. Well, so again, I'm Steve. Uh, you guys recognize my face probably from the other night, and I'm sure you're already sick of hearing my voice, but uh, uh, we talked really fast there about the equipment. And I guess what I just want to encourage you is don't get wrapped up in the brands and the type of, of traps, the type of, of lures or anything like that. You can use what you have a lot of times, even, even garden tools will work. So you don't have to go out and invest a lot of money as you get more into trapping, just like with any, any other activity, the more you get into it, the, the more money you can spend and, and, and get higher end equipment. But as long as you maintain your equipment, the, the, even the low end stuff, if it's maintained well, will will catch a lot of fur and, and, and last a long time. So, um, it, it, it's, it's kind of like uh, trucks or guns or cars or anything else and shoes, clothes, there's all kinds of different brands. Don't get wrapped up in that. Uh, get what you can get your hands on, go out, have fun and, uh, and get after them. So that's, I just wanted to mention that, uh, you know, we're not out here to show off. We're just out here to have fun and catch fur. So that's, uh, that's kind of the goal and just something to keep in mind as we go through this. Hey, Steve, while you're on, could we actually did have a question pop up um, how do I properly pro properly release a raptor or predatory bird if I accidentally catch one? So, so you know, properly is, is always the challenge. We, we want it to be, we always want to have you be safe, right? If it's something that you don't feel comfortable, get a hold of, of, of your, one of your DNR officers. Biologists are more than helpful. A lot of times there's county conservation boards. Um, depending on where you're at, that, you know, across the state, there's always somebody willing to help. If you're not comfortable, don't do it. We don't want you getting hurt. That's the first thing. Second thing would be the safety of the bird. If you don't think you can do it without further injuring a bird, uh, we don't want to do that. So um, generally, if you can cover them up, uh, in, in a, if, if, they're, if they're somehow caught in a, in a foothold trap, if you can cover them up, I like to use a barrel with a, with a notch cut out of it for, for releasing almost everything out of footholds. Uh, it simply keeps the animal away from me. They feel a little bit more comfortable in that hole. You can, you can put some weight on top of that barrel and then... Um, let the trap off the off the animal. Um, generally, they're probably going to be fine. 
if, if for some reason they, they have some other further injury, it's good to get a hold of us and we can get a hold of the rehabbers that, uh, that help take care of those raptors. Uh, the big thing to remember is if, if you're following the exposed bait laws, the likelihood of catching a raptor is pretty slim. Um, Vince can, can weigh in on that or to go to anybody else with, that wants to. But, if, you know, if we follow the, the rules to keep the foothold traps away from, from exposed bait, there's, there's very few instances where you're going to catch a raptor. Yeah, there, um, agree with you, Steve. You're more likely to catch a non-target animal, such as you know a skunk or or a possum or something like that. So, um, using the barrel, like Steve mentioned, um, is a great way to do it, where you're you're not going to hurt the animal any more at all there, but still get it released safely. So, um, you want to mention a little bit too, Steve why we're on the topic, um, proper ways to dispatch target animals that you have in your traps, those in a foothold trap. Sure, uh, so obviously that's a, that, that always is, is a biggest concern, right? If you have something, how do you deal with it? Um, if you can, uh, drowning sets are something that have been approved by the, by the veterinarians as humane, it's, it's, it's quick, there's, there's, there's no injury there to the animal. Um, generally, Anytime that we can, well, always, whenever we can, we want to be as quick and humane as possible. So uh, generally the most effective method that, that I have been able to come up with is a, um, is a, 22, a 22 rifle or 22 pistol. Um, there, there's some age restrictions there. So um, if you're carrying the handgun, you gotta be careful of that. But uh, anywhere in, in the, the, the central nervous system, you know, uh, if you take and, and look at an animal and draw an X from, from, from one ear to the opposite eye, and the other ear to the opposite eye, that's an X. It's gonna, that's gonna show the center of the brain and uh, a shot there is good. If, that, if you can't get that angle, um, the ears are gonna go, the, the, the ear canal is gonna go to the center, center part of the brain. So that's where you'd like to, to put that bullet. Um, if you're able to, uh, on coyote sized animals, a, um, a shot to the heart is, is very quick and humane as well. So, um, that, that, that's probably the most effective method that we found. Uh, you don't want to use a shotgun. You, you, know, you don't want to use a large rifle. You're going to cause needless fur damage. And so the, a lot of people will use a 22 hollow point. That's very quick. It's very effective. And, and you can um, humanely dispatch those animals quickly. Awesome. Thank you, Vince and Steve. We do have one more question that popped up. Uh, where is a good ID tag location on the trap so it can be easily identified but stay connected? So as far as the law is concerned, as long as it's on there, we're okay. Um, depending on what kind of animal you're trapping, if, if you're trapping raccoons, um, I would definitely have some extra trap tags in your vehicle. Um, once that, if, if a coon sees that tag, especially on a foothold trap, uh, they're likely to chew on it because it's moving, it's shiny. Um, you can wrap them around the chain. You could wrap them around a swivel, something that it, it, that's something I like to do personally. So they're not wiggling. They don't get caught on brush. They don't get caught when you're moving in and out of the truck. So if you wrap them around a chain link or wrap them around a swivel and making sure that everything can still move freely, that's the best. Um, I've seen them riveted to traps. I, I don't personally do that much because it's just one more place to collect dirt and make your traps rust. Um, so generally where we're going to see them is kind of near the terminal end of the chain down towards where the chain is staked. It's farther away from the trap and, and wrapped up tight is, is generally the best way. Um, just make sure that they're on there and that we can find them. Awesome. And Steve, could you do a little review for those that weren't here on Tuesday? Where and how do you get a tag to ID your traps? So th there's, there's a lot of different versions. Um, what, what the code requires is that we know who's it is. So your name and your mailing address needs to be on there. And so there's some write your own trap tags, which are a very thin piece of metal you can write on with a pencil and you'll see it. Now they don't last very long. It's they're, they're thinner than say a pop can. Um, we've had some people make their own where they engrave them. Uh, some people have engraved the bottom of their traps. That doesn't really work because we can't read them. We're looking for a tag and, and, uh, and it's challenging to see that. So um, there's, there's a lot of trap supply dealers um, around the state, uh, there's some online. And so, you know, whether it's the snare shop, you know, they're here in Litterdale, Iowa, uh, you got Cots brothers over in Savannah, Illinois, there's, there's a variety of, of dealerships, um, 
all around the Midwest, all around the United States. And so if you go to any of them, if you just type in trap tag, generally they'll, they'll let you order them 50, 100, 200, 500 at a time. And you can, uh, they'll stamp them out into a copper and it's really nice. They just attach them with a piece of wire or a clip or wrap them around the, the, the links. So uh, that's where I would go. It's they're, they're relatively inexpensive, um, you know, pennies a piece and uh, it will save you a lot of work. Perfect, thank you. Um, I actually think we're about, we are ready to move on um, to Vince to say something else before the next video. So the next video you're gonna watch is uh, um, approximately 25 minutes long, I think it is. It's a coon, mainly coon trapping video. Um, it's mainly profiling the pocket set. Uh, Steve will be in the video as long as, as well as Brian Steinus. Um, showing you the techniques for one of the most common versatile sets that you can make in Iowa. Very effective uh, for not only raccoons, but for mink, muskrats, about it almost every, you may even occasionally catch a canine in, in such a set. So water pocket sets coming up. Got a one and a half coral duke here, center swivel with about 10 inches chain uh, that I added on there with two feet, cable with a Berkshire disposable stake on it. Run that just so your trap reaches the hole. Set our trap we want. We got our hole made. If you can see it here, it'll fit right back in there. When you look down the lip of the pocket, I like to have the start of my pan right there. Bed your trap, snug, not all the way down in the mud. You want to make sure that it's not completely submerged. Bury your chain, and then if you're in high competition area, I don't advise shying up the bank. I pull grass back, put the trap up underneath there. Coon are going to work it the same way. But if you're on a private stream like we are in this situation, I appeal is great. To shine it up just a little bit. Take some of our Big Sioux special here. I'll grab a little bit of dry grass, kind of like a wick, roll it up, I'll dip it in the water. I'll take a big old scoop, smear it in there, get her dab where we're wet again, and I'll wedge her all the way back. In my pocket, I like in the back, I like to make a little shelf about an inch and a half out of the water, and that's where I wedge my bait. Keeps it from keeps it from washing out if you're you know in a private creek, you don't have to worry about it that much, or a creek. But like on a river and stuff, you'd like to keep your pocket a little higher so boat traffic and stuff don't wash your hole or wash your bait out of the hole. Then I'll take a little bit dab of our Wapsi River's best. Just put a little smear of that up on the lip of the pocket. And then I'm pretty heavy on the fish oil. And that's our completed set. Any coon that comes from down below us, working across here, we'll be milling around. We're gonna put a couple more sets in there for them. Any coon that comes working this way is gonna be forced around this corner due to the deeper water out here. They're gonna be hugging the bank. We got them, we got them, pretty much got them all funneled in here. Okay, the mud all cleared away from our pocket set. We want to come back up and show you where, how the trap sits up in the pocket. As you look, you can see the loose jaws up in the hole. 
And the reason being, the animals are gonna be, whether there's coon or mink or, or rats, they're gonna be hugging that edge and not gonna be working out here in that deeper water. We got plenty of room out there, leveled off two, three inches of water for the coon to get turned around, maneuver to get squared up to the hole. The way we got the kind of the V notch in the bank and then our pocket, that gets their shoulders squared up so you're not, you don't got a big, huge, wide hole. Keeps the animal, keeps their feet funneled down to the set and take them right over top of the pan. Well, hopefully you learned something watching Brian make those sets. Um, they're all very effective sets and they'll work anywhere in the country. That's, uh, they're, they're foolproof. Uh, very simple and very effective. Um, you know, that's kind of the, the name of the game to put up big numbers. You need to be able to make a lot of sets, make a lot of sets fast, and need to be effective. So uh, that's how you do it. Um, something we'll talk about here with the coon videos uh, is gang setting. Um, you're going to see a lot, of, a lot of clips here where there's more than one coon, and uh, that's real important. Um, you'll see uh, on this mink video, Brian talked about keeping your trap up close. That way the animals can work the bank along the edge of the bank and, uh, the, you know, rather than out in the deep water. And, you know, that mink just goes to show you. Um, you know, you'd have missed him if he had to trap farther back. Um, and you'll see a lot of coon clips, too, where they do the same thing. Um, but also, <laughs> these first few clips, you know, it's broad daylight. So keep that in mind when you're out setting. Um, if you happen to drive by some of your sets later on the day, take a peek at them. You never know when you might pick something up, uh, particularly in a, in a secluded area. And, you know, this coon, even though that's a big coon, he's working up close to shore. Uh, you know, he might have even got him with the, with the back foot there if, uh, if you missed him at the front foot. But he spends a lot of time at the set. You know, hiding that bait way back in the hole or putting some grass in it, uh, that, that keeps him working the set, keeps him there longer. The longer you have him at the set, the higher likelihood you, you have of getting him caught. You know, again, um, I've already mentioned it a couple times, but... Now, I can't emphasize enough that when you're making a set, you know, at, at any specific location, if that location is good enough for one set, it should be good enough for two. Um, if you if you practice that, especially while you're coon trapping, you're going to catch a lot more fur. Um, particularly early in the year, those coon are going to run, you know, one, two, three, four at a time. And uh, if you only have one set out, you're only going to catch one coon. But uh, two or three sets is at the same spot. Uh, that's going to get them. You're already making the stop. You're getting out of the truck. You know, once the sets are made, they're a lot easier to check. And, uh, you know, I, I, I almost everywhere I go, I put two, three, four sets in. So um, that's definitely something to remember. Well, as far as bait and lure going on, on coon, it's uh, really pretty simple. Uh, we use a lot of fish oil. Uh, what that fish oil does is uh, it floats on top of the water and it's going to get caught on... Uh, on sticks and grass and little dead, you know, pools of calm water, and it's going to help those coon locate your sets as they work their way along the bank. Um, if you're in an area with a lot of competition, try to use something different, what everybody else is using. Um, if I'm down by the water, I tend to use a loud, fishy uh, type bait and lure. I'm not going to catch any possums or skunks more than likely, so I'll go with that. And you know, up on uh, up on land, then I tend to go with something that's a little bit more sweet smelling. Uh, So, sorry about that, guys. We had a, a little bit of technical difficulties. Uh, well, we weren't really planning on the weather that we had around the state today. Um, unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to go out and make sets. We, we actually ripped uh, those clips from a couple of DVDs that are out there that uh, oh, my, my Brian Steinis did. But uh, you got to see the animals there. You got the idea of the set. That was the main thing. So, a couple of things that we talked about that the, uh, the voice and the video weren't quite matched up on were uh, um, gang settings. So um, you, you saw the basic set. You, you kind of got the idea of what Brian was talking about, eye appeal, where you could shine that bank up, was taking some water in your hand, just kind of pushing up on the bank and rubbing it around. And uh, any moonlight will shine in that smooth bank. It'll actually reflect a little bit of light and, and, and get the animal's attention. So uh, a big key to trapping, the, the lures, the baits, the attractants are important. Location is the number one thing. You got to be in the right spot. If there's no animals to catch, you won't catch anything. Uh, and then bait and lure. But you know, animals can see farther than they can smell. They're very curious. 
And if something looks out of place, they're going to come investigate it. Good baits and lures are going to get them to, to work that set and get caught. So that's what he was doing there. Um, you, you could see in the video, he's taking his hand in the water, just kind of rubbing it on that bank and shining it up. You got to be a little bit careful doing that. If you're in, a, in an area with a lot of other trappers, you, you may end up uh, losing some fur, or losing some equipment if, um, if somebody has the propensity to do that. So uh, careful there. Uh, gang setting, what he meant by that, different times of the year, you're going to have higher populations. As, as the beginning of the at the beginning of the season, you're going to have uh, uh, family groups of coon running together or, or, or bunches of coon. They may be uh, non-breeding pairs or fr from the year before where uh, they just they, they didn't uh, pair up with any any other adult coon and, and they're still running together and they're going to be moving along the bank to, kind of in unison they just they're you know, everything's social there's very few uh, lone animals so to speak and so putting two or three spots in a good location uh, is going to make you more efficient if you only have to make 20 stops in a day on a big trap line and there's two or three sets at each location that's better than making 40 or 60 stops if they're in good spots. So uh, when I trap personally, if I, if I think the set's good enough for one or the location's good enough for one set, I'm generally putting in two or three when it comes to coon trapping. So uh, the pocket set is, is really your bread and butter. We've talked about that a couple of times. Uh, there, there's no right way. There's no wrong way. That was just a, an idea. Everybody's got an opinion. Do what works for you. Um, big things, make sure that traps anchored, especially in soft ground. And uh, you wanna make sure that when you do capture a coon, you can't reach out and grab sticks and grass and, and pull things into the set and tangle. That'll cause you a lot of headaches. And use a proper size trap. We don't wanna use great big traps for coon. You wanna use a smaller trap that's gonna catch them across the pad of the foot instead of up higher on the leg. That'll, that'll reduce paw damage and, and uh, help prevent uh, fur from getting lost. So um, be safe when you're in the water. You, you find good set locations. You can scout all summer long. And uh, when you get uh, get out there and start making the sets, don't worry about screwing up. There's there's really no right way. Do what works for you. Awesome, thanks, Steve. Um, a quick question for you, Steve and Vince, if you want to answer it. You kept referring to a good set location, a good location. Very broadly, can you give us an example of what a good location is for some maybe beginning trappers if they don't know how to identify that? Sure, that's a pretty important thing, isn't that? I just said it's the most important thing in trapping and didn't even tell you what I was talking about. So um, uh, if we could use an analogy, so if you're on a gravel road, you might see a car. Pretty good chance, right? If you go to a, a county road, there's a higher likelihood of seeing a car. You go to the highway or the interstate, you're going to see vehicles. So if you, if you think of it like that, um, you want to you want to make a set where the most roads are coming together. So you want to find travel corridors, whether it's uh, two streams intersecting, um, a, a fence line running to a stream, a, 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 a easier place to walk. Um, wherever animals are congregating is going to be your best location. Every animal is a little bit different uh, and they all have different habits. If you have a stream that's winding, uh, maybe the outside corner of that stream on the high bank is going to be a great spot for a, for a dry land coon set. And if you have uh, uh, two or three small streams coming together, that may be a good location for uh, one or two sets for animals that are traveling down that drainage. So um, look for those intersections and, and the best way to do that, um, find food and animals need food, water, or shelter. So find those things and, and find paths going to and from them. And that's going to be your, your, your best location for, for really any animals. I'm sure Vince has some, some, some good advice there, but uh, that's, uh, that's very broad and very quick, but uh, go out and scout no different than hunting or or fish anything else you got to find the right spot and uh, it'll increase your success i completely agree steve the only thing i would add on to that is to if you like the outdoors you know when you're out fishing in the summer or turkey hunting in the spring always keep an eye out for sign so you don't have to do all your fur scouting during the fur season you can be out there whether you're running your dog or out hunting for fishing, you know, pay attention to fur sign at all times of the year. Awesome, thank you guys. Um, so I think before we go, move along, we're actually gonna take a 10 minute uh, break just so you guys can get some water, stretch your legs, check on your kids. Um, so it is 6.51, so why don't we meet back here at seven o'clock and we'll get going for you guys again, okay? Thank you.
Hey guys. Um, so I saw some awesome questions going on in the chat box and Adam, I am actually attaching a link to the um, hunting atlas for you right now. So I will have that out for you in a second. But I know that Vince and Steve are responding to some questions in the um, chat box and Steve or Vince, did you guys want to touch on um, the questions that were being talked about in the chat box real quick? And then we'll move on to other questions that we have in the Q&A. Uh, the, the one, and I just wanted to make sure I was clear on the, uh, 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 speaking to Adam, but everyone, uh, one of the questions asked the other night was, uh, are there any specific game management area regulations? And I'm not sure if I was clear, um, we don't allow pre-staking on ga game management areas or the road right of ways. So that is something I, I just can't remember if I said that or not properly. So um, can't, can't pre-stake before the pre-staking time. And then, uh, we generally get grouped um, in together, the county, the state, and the federal land managers, which is fine, but um, there are there's different ownership in some of them. Some of them may even be city owned. So if you're gonna go to a public piece of ground, just make sure that uh, if it's not state owned that you, you follow any special regulations. And the IHAPs are, are hunting only. And uh, if Vince has more to add on that, that's great. But I just wanna make sure I was real clear on that so we don't uh, inadvertently get somebody in trouble. If you're unsure what IHAP is, um, that's Iowa Hunter Access Program. So that's private land under agreement to allow hunting from the public where they don't have to ask that per permission from the landowner, IHAP. Um, the only other thing I'd add to Steve's answer, um, thanks for answering that Steve, is to you know just use common sense. It's the biggest thing as a trapper. Um, we kind of touched on that Tuesday night in the session is to you're out there to trap but also remember you're you're being noticed by other hunters you're being seen by cars going by you know so think about your image use common sense when you're out there don't set a, a trap in a spot that is very likely to get pheasant hunted every day or more than once a day you know find you know think a little bit about where you set make your sets because it's not too fun to catch a hunting dog and kind of gives a black eye to trappers, you know, but other than that, enjoy being out there. You do have a right to be out there trapping just like anybody has the right to be hunting on our public land too. That's all I have, Sophia, for that, I guess. Awesome, and I will be attaching a link in the chat box about how you can properly remove a dog or domestic pet that you have caught in a trap. Um, I will be putting that in the uh, chat box here pretty soon so you guys can have a better idea and you can have that on hand. Um, we did have a question for Steve. I'll read it out to you from Eli. I'm starting to have fun with outdoor target shooting. Now I'm considering going after live game by hunting or trapping nuisance animals like coons to start. My folks live on a farm and they have a tons of coons and coyotes. When I get a coon or coyote, either by shooting it or trapping, do I have to take it to a fur buyer? Can I just bury it, compost it? I don't know. Might sound silly, but what are my options and how long do I have to get rid of it? If it, it is a coon and it is not worth the time and effort to skin it and take it to a fur buyer, what are my options? That, that's a good question, actually. Um, so we'll, we'll skip over all the, all the uh, licensing components of that and we can talk more of that later. You can, you can send me an email or phone call, but um, if you go take an animal during the open season, all, all that's legitimate. If you if you lawfully take an animal, it just has to be removed from the field. So if you if you go out into the, the timber or a creek or wherever and you, you trap it or hunt that animal, the, the usable person, portion of a fur bearing animal is the fur. So that needs to be brought back home. Once once you've taken it, you know, once you've completed that, you you could compost it, you're utilizing it for, for that because because there is um, a a pretty uh, pretty low market right now. Um, if uh, if you want, you could give that to to a, to a trapper and, and let them utilize the fur and, and potentially gain some value there. If if you have a trapper near you, ask them. Maybe they'll show you how to skin it and, and process that fur. Uh, what I've been encouraging people to do this year with the uh, with the suppressed fur market is is learn how to finish your fur. If you happen to damage some pelts, it's it's much better deal to damage them now when they're not as valuable versus 
when uh, when the market comes back and the coon are worth 10, 20, 30 dollars a piece. And so learn how to do all those things. It is a little bit of work, but it's 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 kind of fulfilling and and you get to uh, to really learn about the animals and you can see the differences in the hides as the season progress. You you learn a lot about them. So uh, I'd encourage you to to learn that process so that when the market does come back, you can you can make some money. If you don't want to, as long as they're taken out of the field, you you've met the legal requirements and you can uh, you can dispose of them any way you need that you, you'd like on your own property there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. Vince, did you want to talk a little bit about our next video coming up? So yeah, thanks, Sophia. The next video you're going to be watching is uh dirt hole sets for predators, mostly uh foxes and coyotes here. Um, Steve and Brian will be showing you guys a basic dirt hole set and some of the variations with that. So that, that's the most common, you know, or one of the more common dry land types of sets, you know, to be making in Iowa. So um, it's effective and works quite well. That's why we wanted to show you that technique. That's all. Show you how to make a dirt hole set um, you know i'm showing you the way i do it you talk to brian he does it a little bit differently we both put up fur that's the main thing uh, i guess what i want you to understand is there's a million different ways to do the same thing uh, as long as you're efficient put your sets in good locations use good bait and lure and use good traps you're not going to have any problems catching fur the dirt hole is going to be your bread and butter set if you're going to be out trapping predators you need to learn the set start from here and move on into making the other ones so it's a real easy set to make it's really effective does a great job catches a lot of fur, fox, bobcats, coon, coyotes, badgers, it'll, it'll catch them all. So um, that hole has a lot of eye appeal. You get a lot of variability with the set. You can put in two holes, one hole, a big hole, a small hole. It doesn't really matter. It's just a lot of variation there. What I like about the dirt holes, it's a real natural set, um, especially fox. You know, young fox are constantly digging things up and reburying them. Uh, so it's a natural, it's an instinctive thing for them to do. It's real natural, and that's why the set is so effective. So uh, first thing I do when I make a dirt hole set, I dig my hole. Okay, I want it at about a 45 degree angle. Um, six to eight inches deep is good. 10, 12 inches is better. The deeper that hole, the harder the animal's gonna have to work to get at your bait. The longer they're gonna be at the set, the better chance you have of getting them caught. So, like I said, first thing I do is dig the hole. Then I dig my trap bed, anchor and bed the trap, put my bait and lure on, and I move on down the road. So, the uh, reason I chose this location, you probably can't see behind me, but there's railroad tracks and this real long fence. It runs for over a mile. This is a split in the field. There's beans on this side just to north, north there's corn so i uh, got the bean stubble right here some backing um, what i can tell you on the dirt hole set is that uh, uh, coyotes don't really like the high backing fox don't really seem to matter uh, coon don't really seem to care either or badgers but uh, um, this is a shovel brian makes works really good it's real long i can get right down in there and and get the hole dug so that's the first thing we're going to do So like I said, you want to get that hole dug at about a 45 degree angle, 10, 12 inches deep is real good. Deeper the better. Scrape some of this back so it's not tangled up in our chain after we catch something. And we're going to dig our trap bed. Don't waste a lot of time. Just get that trap bed just big enough for your trap and uh, bed the trap and cover it up and move on. As you're digging, you want to save some of your dirt for your sifter. Put some loose dirt in the bottom of your trap bed. That'll give you something to bed your trap in real solidly. Drive this anchor in. I prefer the standard Berkshires. Got about 18 inches of chain uh, with a couple of uh, mid-chain swivels on my traps. Now when I drive that trap in, I drive it past my first swivel, give a little tug, that first swivel's right at the top of the ground, now right at the bottom of my trap bed. Um, most of my traps are one and three quarters. I use Victor's, I use Duke's, that's number two Montgomery's, that's number three Montana's, and number three Victor's, but probably 90% of my traps are one and three quarters. They're very versatile, good on fox and coyotes, good on coon, they catch badgers, and I've caught cats in them as well. So if you want my top trap choice, 
that's what I would go with. We're going to adjust our trap. Put some loose dirt in the bottom of this hole. Wiggle the trap in there. Pack dirt around it. I tap both jaws, that trap's not moving, it's real solid. We're going to throw a pan cover on there, cover up the trap. What I like to do in my dirt holes is put all the rough dirt behind the set, acts as a jaw guard, and forces them to step in front of it on top of my trap. I tend to blend my sets in a little bit. It does a good job for me. Again, I like to leave some of the rougher stuff on the back here. Acts as a jaw guard. You don't want any high spots, don't want any low spots. Um, I'll put a couple of jaw guards in the front there too, just to encourage them to step on that pan. I don't get real worried about trap placement. I figure all the animals are different sizes. I tend to crowd the hole. Um, from the back of my hole to the center of my pan is about a hand width apart. So. Uh, Right there's my pan, just a little bit off-centered. Got the hole dug about 10 inches deep. And some rough dirt back here to force them over top of that, uh, over top of that loose jaw into the pan. We're gonna put some lure on both sides of the back end, some bait down the hole, and we'll be ready to go. I carry a fork around for my bait. It seems to work real good. What I'll do is put that bait right down the hole on top of some leaves. And I'll cover that up with, uh, with a few leaves as well. Shove them now on top of that hole. Down in the hole on top of that bait. That makes them look for it a little bit harder. Makes them work the set a little bit harder. The longer they're there, the better chances are you're gonna get them caught. I use a lot of popsicle sticks for my, uh, for my lure, but when you're out in a cornfield like this, you have all kinds of options. So put a little bit of that on each side. You can put it up on the, uh, up on the backing. And I usually like to put one right at the right at the lip of the hole too. So that right in the hole, and then I just leave my stick down there. It's just a little bit more appeal for them. Well, that set's done. Again, it's in a good location. A couple jaw guards in front of the in front of the trap, some jaw guards behind it, everything's blended in a little bit. And we're ready to move on. The key to these sets is to make them quickly, make them effectively, and get on down the road. The more sets you put out, the more fur you're gonna catch. So traps bedded firmly, traps anchored solidly, it's level. If jaw guards in front, jaw guards in back, got our backing, we're gonna catch some fur here. We spent quite a bit of time putting together some real nice night vision footage for you. The whole purpose of that is so you can see how the animals actually work the sets. There's a lot of theories out there on what the animals are doing. In my opinion, the best thing for you to do is watch the animals. And now you're going to know how they're going to work the sets. You know where to put your traps. You know what kind of areas they're traveling in. So uh, the results don't lie. We're using our baits and lures here. Uh, these sets don't have traps at them. They're just mock sets to show you how the animals are going to work a set. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, you're going to learn how these animals come in, they're going to come in from downwind, and you're going to see right where you need to put your traps. You'll notice on this, uh, this clip in the next one how fast this coyote gets the lure stick, grabs the bait. Uh, that's one benefit to having that deep hole at your dirt hole sets. I'm a big proponent of that. You know, dig that hole 10, 12 inches deep, the animal's going to have to stick around the set longer to get to the bait and that just increases your odds of catching them. You can see here, this hole's gotten pretty big. A badger actually came up and dug out a lot of that hole, but notice where coyote's front feet are. I tend to crowd the hole when I'm trapping. It doesn't matter if I'm trapping fox, coyotes, coon, whatever. I crowd that hole, and a lot of times you pick up that, uh, that animal when it, on its first step into the set.
you know, a lot of people get real worked up about equipment. I've already mentioned that most of my traps are one and three quarters. I use a lot of Dukes. I use a lot of Victors. I use some Montana and some Montgomery stuff. Don't get worked up on that. Uh, I guess one theory on it is, you know, a, a Duke trap may be, uh, it may be lesser quality in some people's opinion, but I've caught a lot of animals in them and, and held them and, and done very well. In my opinion, I can go out and buy two dozen or three dozen Dukes for the price of uh, some of the higher dollar traps. I think I can catch more fur with uh, with three dozen uh, more economical traps than uh, than one dozen of the higher price stuff. So it's just my theory. Uh, seems to work out pretty well for me. Get a lot of steel out in the ground and, and increase my odds of making catches. I'm sure you've noticed already that in several of these clips, the, the coyotes have urinated on the set. Urine's just the way that they mark their territory. They do it all the time. Uh, urine's a real effective attractant. And uh, you can use that in almost all your sets. It'll help you produce fur. You're going to notice that these fox are pretty cagey around the dirt hole sets. You know, they really don't like the camera. I've noticed that in quite a few of the, the night vision clips that we've had. But uh, they're just notoriously wary. You know, they're, uh, they're the less dominant species, especially when you're in coyote country. Those, those fox don't want to stay out in the open very long. They have a chance of getting killed by the coyotes. So. Again, the same thing. Uh, once these fox come into the set, they're going to work it from downwind. Uh, in my opinion, fox are a little easier to catch than coyotes. It seems like they'll work a set a little bit harder and uh, stay until they get that bait out of the hole. So if you do a good job getting your trap bedded properly, you're going to catch them. So. Again, I crowd my trap right up close to the hole. I just make sure that I use those jaw guards, whether it's little chunks of dirt or pebbles or corn cobs or whatever it may be, something to get them to step over top of that. So I always crowd my hole, and it seems to work really well for me. You can see this fox looking down the hole. I've mentioned that I'll usually throw uh, throw my bait in on top of some grass or leaves and then throw some grass and leaves on top of it. If you can keep them uh, wondering what's down that hole, that's also one thing to help keep them at the set a little bit longer. Just like with the coyotes, the fox like urinate on their sets. It's just the way they're marking their territory. They're pretty, pretty comfortable doing that, and that's how they know... Uh, who's around. You see this fox initially works the set from the back side. That's where your backing comes into play, as well as having that hold a 45 degree angle. There's basically no wind right here. You can see the, the grass isn't moving in the background. But with a little bit of backing that I had and, and having that hold a 45 degree angle, this fox works around to the front side of the set. And again, if I had my trap up close, we'd have him caught. So uh, this fox will stick around and, and keep working that hole until it's got the bait out of there. So you know, a well-bedded trap is going to help you catch that animal. There's a lot of good baits and lures out there. Uh, you know, they're all going to work to some degree. Some are better than others. Uh, it's just the way it is. Uh, most of the coyote videos you saw have Midwest Best, and that's my favorite coyote bait. Uh, this particular hole has farmland favorite down in it, and that seems to be a really good fox bait for me. Those are you know, probably my number one fox and coyote bait. You know, If you get a fox to sit down at the set and keep coming back, uh, obviously she wants to get that bait. She's going to stay there and get caught. Uh, so just make sure that trap's bitter properly. You put it in a good spot. Use good quality product, uh, like some of the stuff that we're providing for you, and you're going to catch fur. You can see this fox has come back on several occasions, marked her territory, and, and spent quite a bit of time digging in that hole. So it's a real good spot, and uh, got a good bait and lure down there at a good location. You're going to keep catching fur. You probably noticed that fox just grabbed her back and pulled her away. Uh, wind must have been coming from a different direction that night, but uh, again, she's trying to work the backside of the set, 45 degree angle.
All right, that was an awesome video demonstrating on how t how the animals actually maneuver around. When I first started trapping, I would never have thought of actually going and utilizing different nighttime vision um, cameras and footage about uh, my uh, mammals. That's awesome. Super happy you guys got to see that. Uh, Steve, I think wanted to touch base on a couple of things that you guys saw in that video. And then also after that, um, we do have a couple questions waiting. So, um I guess the first one is safety is always our major concern, right? We're, no matter what we're doing outdoors, particularly when you when you work for DNR, that's something we definitely promote. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I use the back of my hand on uh, working the dirt around those sets as much as I can. Um, seems kind of dumb, but uh, after I say it out loud, you'll you'll notice that if I happen to bump the pan and snap that trap, it's just going to push my hand up. I'm not going to have my fingers in it. I mean, it's not going to hurt you, but it's not overly comfortable either. And then you end up having to get yourself out of the trap. So. Um, I've done that a lot of times. Uh, you can make fun of me. That's okay. I don't mind. But uh, use the back of your hand. It's a little bit safer. Um, when I'm packing dirt, or I usually will pack the dirt around the jaws of the trap. I use my other hand just to kind of hold it. So that way, if the trap does snap, it just kind of bounces off my hand and, and doesn't pinch my fingers. Um, I made a comment about uh, equipment. Again, we're not worried about brands. We're not trying to promote one or the other. But uh, if you buy an older trap, want to make sure that has good strong springs. So you may want to replace springs. If, if, if you bought an older trap with weak springs, it's, it's going to give you better holding power and, and not cause uh, foot damage. Anytime that you, the, almost every trap that I've ever bought, I've added swivels to the chains. Uh, swivels, uh, trap trains can freeze. They can freeze into the ground. They get sticks, grass wrapped up in them. The more swivels you have, the, the better you're going to hold your animals. So those are, those are two things to, to keep in mind. Um, and I guess, uh, Location is one of the things that I, every, every time, I can't stress that enough. If you don't have animals there, you're not going to catch any. So if you noticed on the, the video with the coyotes and the badger, there was a road right on the far side of those animals. That road, it's a field road, runs through um, that farmer's entire property. It's, it's a mile or more long, uh, easy path for animals to, to, go, to follow. Um, it actually wise just past that set location and uh, so you got two roads that they can follow. It's at the bottom of a valley. Uh, there's a couple of different fence lines that, that intersect right there. And there's a creek line that runs. So it's, it's a, a whole, a bunch of long running barriers that those, those fox and coyotes will follow. And um, I can tell you how many animals I've caught in that set over the last 20 years. If you look back at those videos, you'll see how wore out it is around that, that location. It's, it's an incredible spot for me. Uh, that, uh, that fox was working a set on a, on a corner post and um, that's a real it's outstanding feature and one really good way to find that is if you have access to a property get down low uh, squat down get your head a couple feet off the ground and, and look across the landscape and if something stands out to you it will to them as well so just a couple of good things to, to keep in mind when you're when you're looking for that spot um, you know animals don't like to run on the ridge tops necessarily they want to run just over it they can see over the ridge top and still smell but they're not stuck out in the open they're not they're not silhouetting themselves against the sky against the sky but if you see uh, uh, that, that lone feature that really stands out, maybe a, a tree on a fence line or, or the last tree on a point of timber, you want to look in that area. It's something that's going to get their attention. So just a couple of little tips that we were talking about. And uh, get out and scout, look for scat, look for tracks, and you'll be in good shape when you set your traps. Awesome. Steve, while you're on the topic of good locations, uh, we had Russ ask asked for advice on beavers maybe swap to the water talk and give a little advice about where to place a beaver trap sure the good thing about them is they leave a lot of sign um there's a there's a lot of different theories on on how many animals are in the location but if you find uh, uh down corn if you find uh trees that they've chewed on uh you find feed beds you you want to beavers are easy to find sign and always set on sign um if you look at the bank, if it's dry and, and it doesn't look like there's any fresh cutting around, the beavers have probably moved on. But generally, if they're still there and they're active, uh, that slide is gonna be wet coming out of the water where, where the animals have come up to the bank and, and maybe run up or down. Um, if you get into uh, into the water and look at the beaver, the beaver runs uh, for bank dens, um, if you step into them, if they're real soft, they're probably not active. If the bottom's real firm, they're probably an active den. That's one good tip to uh, distinguish between uh, whether the, the hole is being used or not. Um, but yeah, fresh trees and uh, and corn stalks and, and and chewed up limbs in the waters the best uh, the best indicator that they're they're 
currently in the area. As far as set locations, I set where the most activity is. Um, depending on what kind of sets you're using, um, you know, the, the condor bears are maybe gonna be in front of the, the, the active den sites or in, in the middle of the creek, if, if they're swimming up the creek and use the, you, know, you can really fence beavers off and uh, force them one direction or the other and then use a dive stick to push them into that body gripper. Uh, snares are great in, um, in the, the trails going up down the bank. A lot of times with the beavers, they're, they're in and out the same location so many times, there's almost a trough in the ground. Um, I will caution you with snares on those, you're, you're, uh, particularly in the spring, uh, all the animals are using them because they're easy spots. So I, I, I wouldn't recommend setting those in the spring. You're gonna catch some coon, coyotes, um, and, and any other animal that runs up and down those. Um, if you're going to footholds for beavers, the great thing about that is the, uh, the beaver caster or the different beaver lures will draw them uh, relative, you know, relatively far. So even on a farm pond, if you set just the upside, upwind side, uh, which in the fall generally we're going to have northerly, uh, a northerly aspect to the wind, it'll blow that scent across the pond and, and you'll have a lot of activity. So. Uh, if, you, if you're not using the lures, it's, it's going to have to be travel routes that are, that are active. But using the lures, uh, just go to wherever you have deep enough water to, uh, to effectively drown a beaver and uh, make sure that they're not getting caught. Uh, if you're using chain traps, make sure they're not getting caught uh, up in things on the bank. If you are going to use chains instead of drowning set for beavers in the footholds, make sure to use a long chain. And I'd recommend setting for a back foot catch just so that you, uh, you can hold your beavers and not lose them. Awesome, thank you. What about, can you explain what a jaw guard is? That's a good question. So uh, once that trap is under the dirt, you don't really want, you want the animal stepping on the pan of the trap to, to set the trap off and not on the jaw or the springs so that you, you just kind of have to keep track in your head where that jaw is. And it could be just a, a, a rock or a, a piece of, a little piece of dirt. It could be a stick. Uh, you could poke a stick in the ground and just something to get the animal to step over the over the jaw and onto the pan rather than on the edge of it. Awesome, thank you. One more question before we move on to the next video. How do you remember where you set your traps? Flags, GPS, seems like it'd be easy to lose traps. That, that's a very good question. Um, what I encourage people to do is, is take notes. Uh, whether, um, you know, there's there's a lot of, uh, of, of apps on the phones now, uh, not, you know, Onyx and there, there's multiple that you could actually put to a GPS marker, map, mark them on Google Maps. Um, if you print out maps, draw yourself as, you know, locations, I set locations that are effective. What I've done for years, uh, you know, something that my, my dad <laughs> showed me years ago, you know, just draw a picture on, on a tablet of, of the farm. You drive into a field, sketch the outside of the field, maybe make some uh, notes to where, uh, um, your sets are going to be or why you can kind of look back on that from year to year and uh, you may maybe want to change something slightly or you find one set that's super successful um, really successful trappers will actually keep track of the bait and lure that they used in that location or that time of year and over time just like finding your favorite spot to hunt ducks or pheasants or deer you you learn the area so uh, i would actually encourage you to keep track of on paper where everything's at if for some reason you know you know, we don't want you to get hurt, but uh, I've, I've seen that in my job where someone's injured and they had to send their buddies out to raise their traps. It's pretty hard to explain to somebody over the, over the phone where they're at, but if they have a map, they can find them. So um, if you if you continue to set the same spot, you'll remember them. I, I actually just remember most of mine now because I've been setting them for a long time. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've moved across to Iowa and, uh, you know, I, I can still remember where I set traps earlier in my life because I did them repetitively. Um, once you get into the habit of finding certain set locations, you'll end up seeking out certain spots that are similar to other spots that you've had success. So um, the first time, write some notes, write a lot of notes of, of what you're catching, where your traps are, what kind of trap, how many. And then uh, as, you, as you become more experienced, uh, you'll, you'll come to realize that you end up setting your traps in the same spot all the time because of uh, it's that, uh, it's kind of like training a dog. If they do the right thing, they get a reward. It's the same thing for you trapping. You do the right thing, catch an animal, you remember that. And that's what your body, your brain kind of make, helps you look for. Awesome. Thank you so much.
Uh, Vince, did you want to touch topic a little bit on our next video? Yeah, just to also quickly follow up on Steve's answer with uh, losing traps or not wanting to lose traps is if you get into this and, and you are doing this after school or after work or before, so you will get tired and you start burning both ends of the candle, so to speak, writing it down or putting it in whatever app, Google Maps, Onyx, whatever, it is a good idea to keep track of where they're at especially once you get tired a couple of days into it. Uh, moving on to the next video, um, it's going to be on fur handling. Um, we wanted to show you some of this because you've caught your animal, now what? Um, we want to help get it started with showing, you know, a, a good way to take care of the fur here with this video. So how we skin a fox. Um, the tendon right here, you take your knife and go in just down below the ankle joint, go down about an inch and a half. Can you do it on the same thing on the other foot? Push in here, go down about an inch and a half. You don't want to get down into here, but that'll, then you can hang it up like that. Then it'll keep it from pulling down. When we start the fox, before we even start cutting up there, we go right at the front foot ankle joint and we start our knife right where the, the black and the white kind of here. And we go right down to the knee that's a little easier to pull the leg through when you get down there skinning. Okay, when you make the opening cut where you got them hanging here, you start your knife in the same spot. But be very careful. It's better to go down in the, into the meat and get a little meat. You can cut that off later and get it when you're fleshing. It's better to take a little bit more so you don't nick it because they got really, really, really thin leather. Um, and this, this particular fox we caught, there was a coyote and a fox double. And you can see somewhere here, I seen it when I was combing it out, there's a nick. There's a bite mark from a coyote underneath there, so we're going to be very careful to work around that so we don't hit it. But anyway, we start here. You cut right where it separates here, the color separates. Cut right up to its butt. Right to there. And you can do, you can still do it while it's hanging up. You be very careful to cut a straight line yet. You start right there where your color separates. And you just keep working your knife up nice and slow. Then you take a little bit of the flank and cut around real slow. You stick the knife in. When you're cutting against the bone like that, you always want to put the back of your blade against the bone so you don't dull your knife right away. <clears throat> then you get to that tendon in the back. You want to stick the back of your knife, your dull part of your knife, in so you don't cut that tendon. If you cut that tendon, it's, the whole thing's going to come down. But once you get that all cut around, make sure there's nothing holding because these fox are being so fine leathered. If you leave anything hold and pull, it's going to tear. And just go nice and slow and just keep working around in a circle all the way around it. Then you get down here and you start getting to the meat and it'll start pulling a little bit harder and you just want to stop. Get the inside pulled down. Then you can see here, if you stick your fingers underneath the, on the first side and pull up, you'll see where the, where the leather separates from the meat, that real light white stuff. And that's, where you, that's where your cut line wants to follow. If you get up here too much, you'll nick it every time. And it's better to cut towards the meat than the leather, of course. You'll be real careful back here because everything's kind of crammed together right here. <clears throat> and you want to cut around. 
cut around their butt and get that all loosened up. So you can pull this next side down. Then where your cuts meet there, you just grab that and start working that down the same way. Then we'll hang this up so it stops spinning so it's a little easier to watch. Then we'll start up here on the other leg the same way. Back of our knife, go up in there. Start working this side down again. Nice and slow. We'll get down here where the meat's with it from our opening cut, and we'll start peeling that off. Remember just to follow that white line across there. Just keep working down, follow that white. You can see when you pull down, you got your fingers in there, you can see this all separate there. This is your leather, of course, and this is your meat. You can go right along just on the upper edge of it, and then you'll, it'll walk right down. We're showing you on a fox because foxes are a lot, they're not harder to skin, it's just you gotta be a little more fussy because they're so light leathered. Uh, when you do like a coyote, they're tougher leathered. You can you, you skin it 100% the, the same way, except there's the, you can you can get a little closer and their leather is a little tougher when you pull them. They don't pull apart like these. You grab this and you pull down with like one finger through here and you pull down on it, you'll pop a hole right through there and probably rip that whole corner off. But we'll just keep working our way down to get the tail out. Then when you get back to the back of the hips, underneath the tail, everything's, you think that you're going straight through, but you're not, so you want to keep slowly cutting there. Because what I've seen a lot of people do is they just run their knife through there, and then once you get the animal skin, whether it be a coon, coyote, fox, whatever it is, there's a big hole back there, and that's where they grade back there. So you want to always go up higher back towards the animal to make sure you're safe so you don't nick that because what happens is when you do nick that when you go to put your animal on a stretcher or you pull down on it and you forget yourself because you're not used to cutting them always right there and you pull down on it and you pull the tail right off so you just keep working around the tail like that You get down there a little ways and you stick your knife in. Like that, straight down the center of the tail. Cut that little bit of meat loose there. Keep working that down, then you just keep working the sides of your tail down. Go slow right down around here just to make sure that you don't want to lose your tail. Okay, let's keep working this tail down. Then once you get down so far, <clears throat> we'll grab our tail strippers. This is the tail strippers that we make. You put your tail right through there, hold on to the bottom of your fur. Pull back against the animal, and go nice and slow, and it'll pop right out. <clears throat> now we just take our little tail zippers there, then finish the rest of the tail the rest of the way out, and get started these big old bushy tails. You gotta make sure you get all the way down in there and go straight down it. Right down to the bottom. Okay. Yeah, we got the tail out now. Now we'll just cut away a little bit more of this. This fox 
was the one that had the nick in the side from the bite mark from the coyotes. So we'll be very careful working our way down around here. Normally you can start putting a little bit of pressure on them to start working your way down, but we know there's a little hole. You can see here where the damage is. So I'm going to be very careful to work around them. Just keep cutting, same way you did up there where the leather separates from the meat. And once you get down there a little ways, like I said, I'm taking my time working around that bite mark. But I never grab a fox like this and pull down like you would like on a coon or nothing like that, because you grab like that and pull, you're gonna, it's going to rip. So what I do is I take both hands and I just pull down nice and slow. Keep working that down. You don't got to get carried away. Just keep slowly working it down, spinning the animal. Coyotes, you ain't going to be able to pull them like this. That's pretty much you got to cut them all the way down. Then you get down here, and the meat from the front legs will start coming down on the leather. You just stick your finger in there, pull that loose. Stick your finger on the other side, pull that loose. And you can pull down a little bit more in the back. And then you get to the front legs, and everything right here is going to be crammed together, so you're going to want to take your time. So what I do is I come down the back, and I want to get the back down farther. So be very careful down around here. because so you don't want to get any more nicks, and you're, when you come to turn them, it's hard enough to work around them front legs when you're turning them to keep them from ripping because they're such a narrow animal when they're finished on a stretcher. One little nick, and you go to turn it becomes a big nick really fast. Just keep cutting down around there until you get underneath that front leg. And after you get down there a ways, you stick your thumb. I always push back up towards the rib cage a little more to get it to come out. And then you can just pop your front leg right out just like that. And we'll go to the other side, you pull down a little bit, pull up on the front leg to get room in there so you're not pushing, trying to push your fingers through the leather. And you just pop it right back out through the outside, put your finger back in there and pull down. See, now, now you got this all spread out, now you can actually see what you're cutting. And then on our front legs, when we first started the fox, I slid up the fox to the front leg, or up to the front knee. And then that just comes out like that nice and easy. Walk right out nice and slow. Then you come back just to where, you, where your cut is. You come back here and just start working around again. And you get down there a little ways and you can put a little pressure on it. You just keep working down, then all of a sudden you'll get it to break over. And once it breaks over, that'll get you down to your ears. And I take the back of my knife, the part that ain't sharp, and I'll, I'll put that down towards the skull, run it through like that, so you're not digging into the skull. I stick my finger in your ear. Start working around like that. Stick my finger in the other ear. Just keep
keep working around until you get close down to the eyeball. And when you get to the eyeball, you're going to want to cut back up towards the skull to get that eye socket loose. A lot of people come right down off the edge of the eye and cut straight down, and well, then you got a big, huge eye. You just work your way around in a circle again. Just keep working front to back. Keep everything even and take your time and won't have no problems. When you get that bottom lip just about to the end of the jaw, when your finger can fit through there, go right to the top of your finger on the bottom lip and cut straight out. You don't need that because what happens when you put that on your board, that folds over and then it won't dry, so it all has to be cut out anyway. But when we put the fox up on a wood board, we can show you that. You just keep cutting around there. You don't want to cut the cartilage around your nose because if you cut that cartilage around there when you go to put it on the board, it's always wanting to fall off and then you won't get no extra nose pull. And that's it. And now we'll show you how we, there's not a lot of fleshing on a fox or a coyote, but there's a few spots that we do want to hit just where the meat is. Like I said, it's better to get a little more meat than it is to nick the leather. We'll show you how we just hit a few spots on there and then we'll show you how we put fox up on a wood board. Now we're going to show you how we, we flesh them a little bit. You can see there's meat in between the front legs and a little bit here. We just take that little bit off. It's nice and slow. It'll all just peel right off there. Don't want to get too carried away with them. You just keep flipping it over. There's a little bit on the back there yet you can see. Just knock that little bit off. A little bit on the other leg yet. Shoulder there. Just hit that, knock that little bit off. And then right down. Then we flip it, we can flip it over. You can do it this way and do this little bit. What I do is I flip it over because there's always a little bit of meat back there where you open it up. And you start up here on the front legs, just pin the head against there and just push this down a little bit down backwards and it'll all come right off. And it'll all walk right down off there. And then I just pull the fox down. Just See that little bit straight here? Just yeah, remember we this is the one that had that bite mark, so we don't want to get too carried away right there. Push that little bit off there. We'll push that meat off there. A lot of this little tiny stuff will will dry on its own. And just keep peeling it right over. Just break up the membrane for the most part. Remove all the meat and break up the membrane. Membrane, And that's about all there is to it. A lot of people I know, they just uh, put their skin on, put them on a stretcher and take a real sharp like fillet knife, fillet knife to them and Trim the meat and the bigger chunks of fat off, which works fine too, but the auction houses like them cleaned up the best they can. Just peel that little bit off. Basically, the few spots that had meat and the belly, we clean that all off. 
underneath the front legs. We clean that off. Top on the top side of the front legs, back of the shoulder straps we cleaned off. And the back here where you were skinning, like I said, it's that meat rolls right off there with the, and I use the dull side of the flushing knife to do all this. You don't need the sharp side. That meat rolls right off, so it's a lot better to take meat off the back legs when you're skinning them to stay away from nicking the leather. And then this one's nice, soft, easy push, and it all walks right off there. But that's the finished product there after we get done scraping them. And now we can take them and put them up on a board for you. This is our drying room. We got about 250 hooks in here. Um, when we're doing coyotes and fox, we go about every other hook. That way there's more than enough room to get air in, in there. So when we go to turn them, they're dry. All right. That was very interesting to see how it was processed. Um, here in Nebraska, I always take my furs and we'll take it to the fur buyer and I don't actually skin out my um, furs, but that was really interesting to see. Vince, was there anything that you wanted to talk about or add to that video at all um, at the end of it? Well, we, uh, with, we're kind of running out of time, but what he was gonna show you guys was how to stretch the animal and put it on a board to dry or cure a bit more. Um, but there's videos, there's quite a few other videos out there and available. Um, I think they're gonna share you some video links here even um, for watching the rest of that. But um, that's a general, that was just one red fox procedure wise or skinning wise. Um, it's a similar skinning method for most of the other critters uh, with subtle differences, but generally the same for coons or mink. Um, so that was kind of a representation of how to skin most of your fur critters. Um, yeah, I, that's all I think I have, Sophia, right now. Awesome. Steve, was there anything that you wanted to say before we do our ending remarks? I, I think Vince nailed it. Um, I will tell you the the fox are probably the leanest animal. They're they're like a mink. They're they're uh, they're very athletic. They're, there's not much fat. Um, a coon is is probably a better animal to start with, but there's a lot more uh, a lot more fat to be removed from the pelt. Um, when you start fleshing the animals, you want to make sure you get all the fat off. The fat won't dry. You always have a greasy spot on that uh, on that pelt. So there's a lot of videos out there. We just wanted to show you the the, the, the quickest and most, you know, and, and, and cleanest video that we could. But uh, you saw that uh, Brian was wearing a, uh, an apron there. That's a good tool. Uh, uh, there's a lot of different fleshing knives out there, but uh, there's a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, online videos that'll help you with that. But uh, uh, the one thing that I don't think we mentioned in the video was uh, making sure all the fat is off. The, the more fat you can get off, the better product you're gonna end up with. Especially with coons. Yes. Awesome. Well, do you guys have any other questions at all why we still have our two panelists on here that you guys would like to get answered real quick? If so, you can go ahead and enter those. Um, I did put a link in our chat box. We do have a small game hunting webinar in November, and there's a link for you guys to go ahead and register for that. It is going to have a great group of panelists, just as like this one, um, that specialize in the small game and they're gonna go over a bunch of awesome things for you. Uh, so it doesn't look like we have any more questions, but if there are any questions that come up, feel free to continue to answer them as I'm going over the ending remarks. Just kidding, we have one. What steps do you take for scent control for predator traps? Steve or Vince, do you wanna answer that? Um, I'll let Steve answer more probably, but from the, there's always different opinions on that. In general, start by wearing some gloves. My, my screen broke up for just a second. I believe the question was, uh, how, do, how do we handle scent control? And um, that's important. You don't want dirty traps. Um, and by dirty, I mean anything, any oils, anything from your truck, any bait and lure on them. But animals are going to concentrate on that instead of where the lures are. 
if they're concentrating that, their feet are behind that and they're not going to be by the set. So uh, gloves are a big thing. Uh, rubber gloves are great. Um, I generally wear uh, cotton gloves because that way I can bring six or eight or 10 pairs with me during the trap line. I, and I use them and, and, uh, and, and then wash them at the end of the day. But uh, rubber gloves are probably better. But I can tell you after, after training dogs and, and working with the police canines, you're not hiding from them. They know you're there. So the longer you spend there, the more, the more hair follicles, the more skin, the more skin cells that are falling on that ground, uh, they're going to know you're there. And so uh, one, one good thing is have a kneeling pad and always use the same side down, uh, particularly for canines and, uh, and use those gloves. I, uh, I like to keep a set of gloves in my, um, in my lure bag. And I use that for, I use one set of gloves for making the set, put them back in my pocket. So they're, they're clean from smells or they're dirty with, 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 with dirt, but then uh, I'll use the, the same set of gloves out of my, uh, my lure pouch to, to bait and lure the sets uh, at, at each day. So uh, gloves are good. Try to not kneel on the ground too much, but uh, uh, make the sets as, as quickly and efficiently as you can, because if you're there, you're leaving scent. Your, your truck is, is dripping fluids possibly and, and your body's uh, leaving, leaving signs that you are there and they're going to know. There's no way to hide for them. Awesome. We had one more question come up. Where can you buy a skinning knife? So, um, most of the, a lot of uh, trap supply houses are, are kind of a one-stop shop. Um, there, there's a lot of them here in the Midwest. Um, like I said, the, the big one here in Iowa, there, there's others, not to pick on anybody, but uh, the, the snare shop in Litterdale, Iowa is, uh, is, a, is a big business. Uh, Cotts Brothers, F&T Trading Post. There, there's a whole bunch of different companies out there. You can get online. Um, if you want to go in and, and, and look at items, you know, that, that's a little bit of an advantage over the online store. But uh, uh, any, any of the online uh, or any of the, the trapping warehouses or, or trap suppliers will have them. They'll, they'll literally have everything that you need. And if they don't have exactly what you want, they can probably find it. So you can order your trap tags and your skinning supplies in the same place. I would add on. Yeah, thanks, Steve. To add on to that, if when you go to one of these places or you're looking online at stuff is some trappers like to have different types of knives or blades. Um, they have openers or starters. Um, some of them use the sharps or scalpel type knives that are really sharp and then they throw the blades, you know, if they get dull and just replace it with the new one. Others like to use, you know, a little bit more specialized knives that they can sharpen and keep using that kind of thing. So doesn't hurt to ask around or look around a little bit, you know, when you're doing that and kind of find what you like. Awesome. Thank you, Vince and Steve. You guys have been awesome tonight. Um, well, I think that's all the questions that we have. If you guys do have more questions, feel free to reach out to either Steve or Vince. We will be sending their contact information on the email that will, that will be coming out uh, late next week. That again, will have the recording from tonight. It will have the recording from Tuesday night, as well as multiple different links to videos that you guys can have access to that should be very helpful, as well as um, link to a different atlas and guides and other things that um, we think that you might find helpful when you guys are out in the field or preparing yourself to be out in the field, as well as there will be a post survey um, going out. And we really do encourage you guys to answer that survey for us and to really um, communicate with us what we did well and what we didn't do well. That way we can better improve our webinars that we are putting on for you guys and make sure that you guys have an all around really good time um, on our webinars. So please, again, please finish and complete that post survey for us. It would mean an absolute bunch. Um, thank you again for coming and participating in our webinar. It, you guys are an awesome, great. You asked amazing questions and it was really good to participate with all of you. Thank you again to our two panelists tonight and then plus Dakota on Tuesday night. You guys all were amazing. Um, again, I just wanna throw a little out there that uh, the small game uh, webinar is going to be in November and there is a link in the chat box as well as if you go to the DNR um, webpage, they will have the small game webinar register link there too. Thank you guys again for participating with us tonight. You guys have all been awesome.